guys, it's DR Drake 63 here today, and I've got something that uh, I've been looking to add to my collection for a long time, and that is uh, an M1 carbine. This one is uh, a 1945 model. Um, how you can tell, and I say 1945, that's not the year it was made. I'll get into that in a, in a minute, but just in terms of how the bayonet works, uh, the cross bolt safety, things of that nature. But uh, this particular one is uh, an inland manufacturing. You see me holding it here with one hand uh, like it's nobody's business. That's because this thing only weighs five pounds. It's ridiculously lightweight. And uh, obviously, uh, if you've seen my videos recently about the M1 Grand, um, that comes in at, at easily twice as much as this rifle. So it's a, a different affair altogether. But uh, um, very, very impressed with um, uh, the craftsmanship of the woodstock on this. I'm going to lead with that. And I'm also going to say that I did quite a bit of looking um, in terms of this particular firearm, inland, new stuff, and why would I want to get this versus something that was uh, that was made, say, back in the day with an original receiver, maybe rebarreled, something like that. Well, in where I live, those are pretty hard to come by. Uh, you can't get them through the, the CMP currently, uh, at least not that I'm aware of. And uh, so I was looking for something that uh, would be a faithful reproduction and, and, and a fairly accurate shooter. Um, this might be kind of a gateway for me into this design, but I've always thought that this particular uh, rifle was just an absolutely cool looking design. Um, until you get your hands on one of these, though, it's pretty easy to uh, come to the conclusion that uh, uh, something like this might be a little bit bigger or more solid feeling than it is. And like I said, it's it's not. It's uh, it's absolutely a smallish type of rifle. It shoots uh, around in the 30 caliber, uh, 30 carabine that, that just is... Um, well, probably best compared to a 357 Magnum, actually. So it's it's not something that, uh, you know, you're going to take this out and it's going to have the same effect that, say, shooting an M1 Grand would have, where you've got just such a, a heavier state of affairs. It's It's got a completely different uh, internal magazine, and, of course, it's firing the 30-odd-6, which is a, a heck of a round compared to the 30 carabine. But... Uh, you know, whereas this is going to have an effective range out to, I don't know, seven, 800 yards if you can hit what you're aiming at, uh, you're going to find that the 30 carabine uh, actually uh, has an effective range that's probably a lot more like shooting a lever gun uh, with, like I said, like a 357 Magnum load. So think of this as your 100, maybe 150 yard, but certainly close quarters combat type of firearm. Uh, these were produced uh, originally for folks that weren't frontline infantry, folks that if they did see combat, it was going to probably be close quarters and they didn't have a need to lug around uh, the weight of an M1 and the various ammo that goes with that. So you'd see a lot of these in Jeeps, you'd see a lot of these in the in the supply areas, rear areas, paratroopers had a version of this with a folding stock. Um, but uh, uh, unlike the M1 Grand, really uh, the idea of making brand new versions of these has really caught on the last few years and you know you have auto ordnance making a version that's cheaper than that one of these new and and i picked this up second hand i'll state one of these new is typically going to cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand bucks eleven hundred bucks uh, i did not pay uh, anywhere near that much it's uh, an actual reproduction that was made by auto ordnance you might be looking more like 750. well i don't have an auto ordnance or ao with me to compare to this rifle and talk to you about why this might be worth so much more. What I can tell you about this that's different than the originals is this has a cast receiver, okay? And so it's not forged. And uh, for a lot of guys, that's going to be a jumping off spot right off the bat. Uh, for me, it's not for a couple reasons. Number one, Ruger, and, and I'll show you the, the Mini 14 here again, which is a good comparison rifle here in a minute. Um, the Ruger folks have been doing... Um, uh, castings for receivers very successfully without any kind of uh, notable failures out there for a long time. The issue is, is how well do they machine uh, the metal after the casting's made, uh, process it, refine it, you name it, polish it. And in, in looking at this, uh, whereas you'll see that uh, outside of some magazine related stuff, this thing functioned perfectly at the range. Um, um, I do see some things in here that I will comment about 
where it looks like somebody just needed to take a file and work on this. And I might actually do that on some areas where there's some needing some deburring and things like that. But overall, um, just a few comments about this. Uh, there's a lot of talk out there and reviews of these done by guys that say, well, these things jam a lot or they're not reliable. And um, here's what I think happens, just, just my opinion. Uh, I think a lot of guys that have never experienced the M1 carabine um, have uh, experienced a lot of uh, firearms that are semi-automatic like an AR-15 or an AK variant. And uh, those are very reliable, next generation, if you will, firearms. Um, and so they'll shoot one of these and they might have a, a jam. Like I said, oftentimes it's going to be magazine related, uh, some kind of failure to feed. And they're going to say, well, this thing's, this thing's junk. It's not reliable, so forth and so on. Or they've shot an older um, uh, M1 carbine that uh, might have seen a lot of action where the parts were very broken in. And kind of like the old 1911s, these things tend to become more reliable with age. But if you're used to shooting an AR, if you're used to shooting an AK, and you pick one of these up and you do a review on YouTube, you're going to compare it to the reliability of that AR or that AK and say, well, this isn't a very good M1 uh, carbine uh, copy. Um, I will caution anyone uh, to remember that uh, we are talking about an older design. There's a reason we went on to uh, different designs as we went along, things like uh, AR and the evolution of that platform. Uh, AKs and things like that, but they all got their start from firearms like this. So that is something to consider. But I'm uh, I'm real happy with the way this thing fires. It's it's uh, it's almost like shooting a cap gun in terms of the lack of recoil, and uh, uh, very pleased with the accuracy I saw indoors today. We'll show that in a minute. I'll buy it. It's it's only uh, 25 yards shooting. You still get an idea whether you're going to group or not, and what your sight picture looks like. One thing I will complain about a little bit. This front hand guard is a little bit high for this front sight. So I can get a sight picture. And as you'll see, I've got an adjustable uh, ramp right here. This just basically pushes up and down and clicks in. And then you can also adjust your windage likewise with this, this particular uh, thumb screw right here. But uh, what you're gonna see is that um, um, your sight picture is not, not a complete circle with the front and back lining up. You almost are, are looking down this groove right here on, on, on the, the rifle as part of your sight picture. And once you figure that out, uh, it does get easier. But keep in mind, this is a closer quarter combat kind of thing. So you're not, you're not shooting the, the eye off and at at 150 yards with this thing. Um, so that is important to consider when you evaluate a rifle altogether. I told you I would uh compare this to the Ruger Mini 14 which in a lot of ways has taken its uh, taken its design very much from the the carbine including the hold open design for the bolt and everything else this is a substantially heavier gun by a couple pounds where this one comes in at 5 and change pounds this particular configuration with the wood stock and the stainless barrel is coming in over 7 pounds. What you have here is a 20 round magazine that's loaded with 5.56 five, and that's going to be a much more lethal round especially a distance than the 30 carbine. This is the 15 round mag and that's uh, from what I understand is your best bet in terms of functionality. But it, just going down you'll see um, you've got a lot of similarities in terms of uh, the look of these firearms no uh, no question where mr. Ruger got his inspiration from you know the copy of uh, of the of the m14 uh, a little bit with the look the size and feel certainly more like an m1 carbine uh, these tend to lose their accuracy in this configuration without a, uh, a barrel stabilizer uh, as they heat up uh, this I've seen today after about 100 rounds was still holding its groups pretty well. So there is that. But um, very similar, very similar. So it's off to the range we go and uh, we're gonna use some, uh, some full metal jacket ammo that uh, we purchased. It's uh, Cellier and Beloit. 
We're going to see how that does uh, for our first go around. One thing I mentioned fussy about magazines. Let's see what happens when you don't push the magazine in all the way. Yeah, you get that first shot off, and it takes me a minute to realize, okay, why aren't we getting a second shot? And I pull the chamber open, I look down, and I can see the table below me. So I decided we'd go ahead and reinsert that, and uh, you can kind of see what's going on in slow motion. Bolt's driving back. You've got pretty consistent, looks like about a 3 o'clock uh, ejection of the brass, and uh, that clears out real nice. Like I said, the only issues we had were with a, a couple of the newer magazines. Other than that, it was a uh, flawless function. Here you see our first shots out of the box. We're pretty far to the right. I was aiming for that target right there. That was at 25 yards, so um, made some necessary adjustments in, in bringing that windage to the left. And after doing so, uh, we were able to get some better results. Here you're going to see, uh, after doing so, we're, we're right about where we want to be. Actually, I did do another click to the left. But pretty decent grouping uh, for a guy that's standing there free-handed shooting a, a trigger that he's not used to. So here you see, uh, again, you have one of those newer magazines. And, and uh, it just was giving me some fits and... Just a magazine issue. It's finicky with magazines like some firearms, like that Mini 14 we showed you tends to be. But uh, just overall, enjoyed shooting this rifle uh, with it being as lightweight as it was. Really easy to hold it on target without having your hand move on you and things of that nature. And really the big thing to get accustomed uh, to was just the trigger itself with a heavier pull. I don't think there's anything you really do about that other than just maybe break it in a little bit. Mandatory rapid fire, which uh, we have with any semi-automatic pistol or handgun. Uh, now that isn't from the rapid fire, but this is taking my time with 15 shots from 25 yards. I'm pleased with that result. We also tried out some uh, mill serp stuff that came with the rifle, and that worked out okay, well. Okay, so I'm kind of running out of room here in the old workshop. Um, build up of years and years of you name it, ammo, tools. Stuff to refinish stocks, drill bits, all of it. So um, we're going to have to do something about that. But for now, this is the space we have. But I mentioned uh, early on how nice this stock looked. And this is, this is a very nice piece of walnut. And I've seen some of these M1 reproductions where they're not nice. Uh, not nearly as impressed with the auto ordinance, for example, in terms of the stock. Now... Is that super important that the stock is immaculate or whatever? Yeah, you know, it's a gun. It's a gun that uh, it's a gun that's used uh, for warfare purposes. So functionality rules the day. But uh, it's still nice to have that. So I'm impressed with that. But what we're going to do is is go ahead and show you how this guy takes down. This is my first time doing it. So if uh, uh, if I look like I don't know what I'm doing, there might be a good reason for that. So as always with any firearm, we're going to go ahead and take the magazine out and check it here. If you, you see right here, here's the button to release it. And uh, that's a real good job. As hard as these can be to put in, it comes out real easily. we will show you here in the chamber is completely empty. Also, I mentioned earlier, it's got a, uh, it's got a hold open feature that's similar uh, like we saw in the Mini 14. And basically you just push this little spring loaded button down. And that's how you, re you release it. So the first thing we're going to do is loosen this barrel band. You'll see this screw right here. We're going to just loosen it. The one thing that I, that I really don't like about barrel bands uh, is that just from my experience with dealing with lever actions and things like that is if you over tighten them, um, you're, you're often going to be sorry you did. So I'm going to loosen this just a little bit more, and then then we'll push in there on the uh, uh, on this little this little front catch right here. So you can see that that is that is held in. And let's find a tool that's not going to mark that up too much. I like to use something plastic in a situation like this. 
and all we're doing is loosening that down just enough to get it underneath and as you can see right here that's pushed down so we should be able to pull this barrel band off without too much too much problem and there you go and that piece as you see right here um, holds holds a uh, your bayonet lug and that, that whole piece slides forward. It's kind of a shroud. And you notice my top hand guard came right off when that happened. And now we have a situation where here's all we need to do to take the rest of the stock off. And it comes right off. And as you can see, it, it seats right in there. That's a nice good fit. You see a screw right here, and what that screw does is basically um, it holds the locking mechanism for the, the receiver in the barrel into the rear right here. So there you have it. We'll set this to the side. And this is, this is your receiver. Not a lot going on here, guys. But you'll see right here, there is a pin. And we want to push this pin out. Don't know if we'll need to drive it out or what the scenario is going to be. But we want to push this pin out and take the, uh, take the, uh, the trigger assembly out. For this, we're just going to use a, a punch. This one's eighth inch punch. And we're just going to drift this right out. And that comes right out just like that. And now I can move this forward. And you can see in the rear here, there's a notch that slides into this back part of the receiver. So that's about as easy as you can get. Okay, next up. Next up, we're going to want to take our, our, our recoil spring, which is this guy right here. And just pull that out. So this little piece right here slides right there. So now we have our operating rod and our bolt is all that's really left. And if this works like if this works anything like my grand, which it does, you have an, a, a slot right here where this pops out, and we just need to pull that off to the side. Okay. So there's a little tab right there. I mentioned earlier the hold open spring that's right here. Okay. So the only thing left is the bolt. And I imagine without even looking that this is going to come out very similarly to what you get with your Garand. Very similarly to what you get with um, your Ruger Mini. And it does. So what you have is you have a free-floating firing pin right there. Okay. And you have uh, locking lugs on either side. Now this one has a really long one on, on this side, much shorter on this. So the kind of inspection I want to do is I want to look like, I want to look at things such as, um, is there any kind of fouling or built up of grease or dirt here under the extractor? Things of that nature. And it all looks pretty good. So, uh, but that's your bolt. So this is, this is basically what we have left. Um, talking about the cast receiver, this part right here, which isn't, isn't a very big part at all, as you can see. Damp. I mentioned your wit and your windage is basically this is just spring loaded and it slides. Um, this says it's a 300 yard zero. Uh, I can't imagine firing this thing at 300 yards, but I'm sure somebody does. But as you can see, this is a cast part. Um, do I wish that this were forged? Yeah, probably. Is it going to matter? Not if they did a good job. I mentioned earlier, though, uh, that I that I was wondering on their deburring, and this is what I'm talking about right here. 
I think that actually needs to be filed down. I, I can't imagine that that's part of the design. Now, it hasn't interfered with anything, but at the same point in time, kind of a nuisance. As far as the rest of this goes, um, it looks like it's pretty clean. Um, obviously, I'll have to do some more checking on that. The one thing I wanted to make sure is that it had a nice, smooth feed ramp, and it does. And, um, you know, as far as other parts, we're just going to want to make sure that we have grease where it needs to be. This is very dry, and I, I shot it that way. This needs to have some grease applied uh, and, and things of that nature. But we're going to clean this up and uh, and put this back together. But as you saw, it was a relatively easy takedown. I didn't really need any tools other than a punch and a screwdriver. Um, here's your, your trigger group. And here's the kind of things that I want to see is, um, here's this is your hammer. And I want to make sure that over time as we shoot this, that this doesn't get peened out of shape. Okay, right now it's not. You can see the mark where it comes into contact with the back of the, of the bolt. And that's the shape it's supposed to be in. That's the kind of thing that I watch. And I've seen it with AKs and other parts where if, if this isn't made out of good metal, you're going to have some problems with it. So, uh, just based on the wear of this and the knowledge of the guy I bought this from, not a lot of use on this. Not a lot of use, but, you know, cast parts, here you go. You see your little seam right here, uh, and you compare that to something that's forged. It's not going to be there, but again, not a, not a huge issue. Uh, and as I told you, it's got a crossbar safety. Okay. They were nice enough not to paint it obnoxious red or something like that. But that's not a new lawyered up kind of thing. That was one of the versions that they used. So we're going to, we're like I said, we're going to clean this up and put this back together. But I wanted to show you guys um, how this thing takes down. And it's not really a big deal. And uh, it was my first time doing it. And I thought it went pretty well. Okay. Well, we've got her all back together and gave her a nice... Uh, a nice lube job. This thing was very dry, and I suppose that's how it came from the factory. I did uh, apply, as you can see, a generous, generous amount of grease. Might wipe that down after a little bit, but uh, um, I'm one that believes something like this, which is a lot of metal and metal, you definitely don't want that dry, and it, it does feel like a smoother action um, than it had been, but. Uh, Overall, though, I'd have to say, cool, um, cool little rifle. Um, probably going to be a gateway, like I said, in, into getting me into uh, getting me into some more authentic, period correct M1s. But uh, you know, um, like I said, I heard some a lot of smack talk about this thing being a jam master, uh, even pre lube. That was not the case. Uh, magazines are the key, guys. I, I don't think these were designed uh, to handle the spring tension of a 30 round magazine up on the bolt. That's one thing that I that I have read. Um, this was designed originally to have a 15 rounder, and uh, with uh, the older USGI type magazines that that I got with this rifle, uh, it did great. With a couple of the newer ones, which I'm guessing are P Pro Mag or something like this, not so much. So. Um, take that for what it's worth, but uh, uh, final thoughts on this in a second. Okay, um, I mentioned to you that after uh, after giving this thing a very good lube job, it was smoother. That's definitely the case, definitely the case. Um, I just can't get over how handy this is. I mean, I just view this almost like it's a big handgun. And from a caliber standpoint, that's kind of what it is. Uh, as we mentioned, liking this more than anything else to a 357 Magnum kind of scenario. Um, but uh, takes down real easy, puts back together real easy, um, uh, fun to fire, triggers a little bit heavy. I mean, you know, you're definitely, definitely in a situation where you're talking about a, a, a fairly heavy trigger pull. My gauge goes up to eight. And that's what I have this pulling at, is uh, just shy of 8 pounds. 
So, you know, it is what it is. Um, um, this is not a marksman's rifle. You're not going to see a lot of guys <clears throat> using these for long, long uh, target practice and things like that. However, um, uh, I can see that uh, that this has been accurized versus the older stuff. A lot of the a lot of the older M1 uh, carbines were known to be anywhere from four to six or more MOA. I'm guessing just based on my 20 yard uh, performance, unsupported. Uh, grouping them in there pretty good at an inch or so that uh, off off of a support rest uh, at 100 yards this is probably about a two to three MOA shooter uh, better with a magnified optic but uh, have to uh, give kudos to this I will say that for the money if you're going to go out and spend a thousand bucks or more on uh, an M1 carbine I would personally uh, try to find one that's an actual original receiver that's maybe been rebarreled and has a nice old stock with some character. Uh, that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. But I do like this. It's new. It's made right, I believe. I think it functions right. And it's a lot of fun. So if you get a chance to fire one of these or pick one of these up, suggest you do it. This is Dr. Drake 63 saying thanks for watching. And we'll see you.